right, welcome to Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I am going to be your virology professor for all, what is it, 25 lectures. This is my course. I invented it, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, and I've taught it ever since by myself because I love virology. I love viruses, actually, and as you'll see in this course, most viruses don't make people sick. So, you know, you may think, well, he's pretty morbid if he loves viruses. Here we just had a pandemic that killed millions of people. How can he be loving viruses? Well, you'll see in this course. Uh, I want you to love viruses as much as I do. And in fact, if you want to understand human health, if you want to understand about disease on planet Earth, you need to know about viruses because they're an essential part of everything that goes on in the planet. I just read a paper last week that shows that viruses, they participate in the formation of rocks. There's a kind of rock called travertine and viruses participate in it. Viruses, well, let's just say without viruses, probably there would be no, come in, it's okay, there would be no life on Earth. And so that's the purpose of this course, to try and uh, teach you a little bit about that amazing <coughs> world of viruses. Now, today I'm gonna start with some cool science. By the way, my goal every lecture is to give you one thing that you can wow someone with, okay? One thing. And every lecture I will do that. And if I don't, you come up to me and you tell me you didn't wow me this lecture. I want you to, to let me know. Every lecture, something is gonna be wowable. So this is the recommended textbook. I'm one of the co-authors, full disclosure. This course is actually based on the textbook, but it has, it's in its fifth edition now. It's, it's the best virology uh, book because it's written in a way that doesn't teach you about individual viruses, but teaches you about processes. So here are the chapters for each uh, here are the chapter names for each of the chapters. There are two volumes. So you can see uh, the infectious cycle, attachment and en entry, making RNA, making DNA, et cetera. And then we have host responses, vaccines, antivirals. That's the way to learn virology, not to teach you influenza virus, herpes virus, polio virus, and separate lectures. That's the lazy way to teach you virology. And if this course were team taught by 25 people, everybody would come and lecture about their virus, and in the end, you wouldn't know anything. You'd know a bunch of facts. I want to teach you an overview of virology, so this is the way to do it, and that's the way this course uh, is designed. So this is one of my favorite pictures from my podcast. So I do a weekly podcast this week in virology, TWIV, 1,070, actually we're at uh, one, what are we at, Karen? A lot, 1,070 something, almost as much as One Piece. <laughs> See, I know about One Piece, yes. I know, but there are other animes that are longer running. But 1,077, that's what we're at, episodes. Uh, anyway, this, every week, actually twice a week, we talk, there's a clinical update with Dr. Daniel Griffin, who's an infectious disease physician, and he talks about what's happening in infectious diseases that week. Pretty cool, it's an hour, less than an hour. And then uh, another episode where we talk about research papers. So if you're into viruses, you wanna get into it more, you, you should listen, you don't have to obviously, but you can find this at YouTube, you can find it at uh, Microbe TV. By the way, this is what I do now mostly. I don't have a lab anymore. I record science programs and I have a studio downtown and Karen up there is my studio manager. Uh, who's come to see what virology is all about today. <laughs> and uh, this is our studio on 7th Avenue, right near Penn Station, where we record tons of science programs. And this is where This Week in Virology and uh, other programs are recorded. And in fact, you're welcome to visit. It's a very cool space. Uh, I can give you the address and you can see where these things happen. People love coming because they have all kinds of artifacts there and you can see the actual process. Incubator at microbe.tv. So the name of our space is the incubator. You know what an incubator is, right? 
<laughs> now, War Andy Warhol had an art studio called The Factory. So we thought we needed a name, so we call it The Incubator. Anyway, so all the editing of these lectures and so forth happens there. We live and we prosper in a cloud of viruses. And prosper is important because you're healthy most of the time. Yet, every one of you right now is full of viruses. I guarantee it. You probably think you're not, but you are. We regularly eat and breathe in billions of viruses a day. The food you eat is full of viruses. The air in this room, if we sampled it, would be full of viruses. I don't have a respiratory infection that's making me sick, but I'm exhaling viruses and so are each one of you. And I want you to understand that. Every living thing on the planet is infected with viruses all the time. They're an integral part of our lives. In fact, we carry viruses as part of our genetic material. Viral DNA is integrated uh, into our DNA. And these are some of the organisms on Earth. They're all infected with viruses, every one of them. So here is a wow fact for you. The whole strategy about viruses is to make lots of progeny because finding a host is inefficient. Because you think about it, unless you're on a crowded subway as I just was, it's not likely that a virus I exhale is gonna find a host unless I'm near people. And so viruses reproduce and make lots and lots of progeny. So here's an example of that. In the waters of the world, primarily the oceans, there are over 10 to the 30th bacteriophage particle. A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria, called bacteriophage, different name from other viruses. 10 to the 30th, this is a huge number, right? More than Avogadro's. So let's do some math to impress upon you how big that is. So one phage weighs about a femtogram. So if you multiply that times 10 to the 30th, the biomass of bacterial viruses just in the waters of Earth, and we're not thinking about all the animal hosts who host bacteriophages. We do because we're full of bacteria and those bacteria have their own phages. But just in the waters, the biomass of bacteriophages exceeds that of elephants by a thousand fold. These are viruses you can't see. If you ordered them head to tail, so these phages have typically heads and tails, if you put them head to tail, they would ex extend 100 million light years into space, okay? So you tell that to someone at some point, they're gonna, they're gonna be wowed, I guarantee it. 100 million light years, right? That's way beyond the nearest uh, galaxy. And what's amazing about it, it's something you can't see. And in fact, in the oceans, huge numbers of viruses, as I've just told you, they infect a lot of the protists, the single-celled eukaryotes that are in the ocean, they infect bacteria, but they also infect the mammals and the fishes that live in the ocean. So here's an example of a virus that infects whales. It's called a calici virus. It makes the whales sick, they can get rashes and blisters and even gastroenteritis, which is vomiting and diarrhea. Whales excrete 10 to the 13 calici viruses a day, each infected whale. And that goes into the ocean and it's part of all, all the viruses in the ocean. And we think that some of these uh, viruses excreted by whales can infect, hum infect humans. And um, a calici virus called norovirus is a very common cause of human gastroenteritis vomiting and diarrhea. So if you're ever sick for two days, you're throwing up and you have diarrhea, you probably have uh, a norovirus. And we actually will talk about these in more gory detail later. One of the th lessons I want you to learn from this course is that most viruses are not bad news. Most viruses don't make you sick, but they get a bad reputation because now and then there are ones that make us very sick, obviously. But some of them are very beneficial. For example, in the oceans, as I've been talking about, first of all, there are 10 to the 30th total, but in a liter of coastal seawater, there are more viruses than people on Earth. So the next time you go to the ocean and you pick up some water, uh, you think about that, it's full of viruses, especially if you take it in your mouth and you spray it at your friend, which we all do, <laughs> spraying viruses on them. Fortunately, they don't infect us. 
they're just there doing other things. They're infecting other hosts. And this is a, a two pie chart to, to emphasize to you what's going on. If you look at biomass in the ocean, that is what weighs the most. So the yellow on the, um, on the left there, those are prokaryotes, bacteria, and they make up most of the biomass in the ocean, followed by protists. The protists are single-celled eukaryotes and viruses, like protists would be amoeba, for example, and there's certainly amoeba in the ocean, viruses. But if you look at abundance, if you count particles, look at that on the right, 94% of the particles in the ocean are viruses. They outnumber everything else. That's where the 10 to the 30th number comes from. Those viruses infect and kill their hosts, and <clears throat> the hosts break apart, and that yields organic matter that floats downwards in the oceans, and it's turned over by other organisms to release elements. So these viruses are important parts of many uh, ge biogeochemical cycles, like the phosphorus cycle and the sulfur cycle, even the carbon cycle. And if there were no viruses in the oceans, I would argue that life would end very quickly because they're responsible for uh, all of these elemental cycles. So very important in the oceans. Another interesting number is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, the agent of AIDS. There are right now 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on Earth today. We know this because we know how many millions of people are infected and we know more or less how many genomes each person carries. It's not as much as 10 to the 30th, but it's still a huge number. In fact, it's so big, and, and you will learn this in a bit in this course, in that number there are mutants already that are resistant to every drug we have to treat HIV and every drug that we will ever make. That's how much uh, 10 to the 16th is. And when viruses reproduce, as you'll see later, they make mutations always, and sometimes those confer drug resistance. So we know in this number, it's big enough so that we have about 30 or 40 antivirals for HIV treatment. We have resistance to all of them out there. Uh, and if we made hundreds more, there would still be resistance to all of them. And the reason we can control uh, AIDS, is, as we will see later, is because we do triple therapy. We use three drugs at once, and that reduces the chances of any of these mutants uh, overgrowing. All right, what about you? <clears throat> How infected are you? So each of us has about a dozen herpes viruses in us. Herpes simplex, one and two, varicella zoster virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, et cetera. I would bet money that all of you are positive, including me. I'm not saying it's just you. It's me as well. Even Karen has them all. We're all infected because you get them in the first years of your life from your parents. It's, most of these viruses are shed in saliva, and your parents like to kiss you, and they give you viruses. And these viruses stay with you for life. Once you're infected, that's it. You will never get rid of them. Maybe one day we'll have the technology to do that, but nowadays we do not. So you have at least a dozen herpes viruses, but you have many other viruses as well. You all know that we have a microbiome in us. That is, we have bacteria, different bacteria specific to different parts of our body. The GI tract, the respiratory tract, the skin, even your fingernails, even your brain has specific bacteria that we need in order to survive but we also have what we call a virome. Uh, you can see this diagram of the human there. All those pie charts are the different viruses that we can find in different parts of our body. So the blue is DNA viruses, and viruses, as you will learn, can have genomes of RNA, unlike anything else on the planet. They can be DNA or RNA, and so the green is RNA viruses. And you can see throughout the body we have viruses everywhere, even in our brain, yet we're healthy most of the time. Now, if you are immunosuppressed, which could happen if you get a viral infection, many viruses immunosuppress like HIV-1. If you get an organ transplant, the drugs to prevent rejection uh, will immunosuppress you. Then many of these viruses will reproduce and they can cause damage. And that's why we have a huge area of transplantation infectious diseases that has arisen to take care of, of these patients. But we are interested in understanding all the viruses that are everywhere. And 
in fact, not just in us, but in other animals as well. And this is a video here which shows you how you can sample whale breath. All right, so those puffs coming out of the ocean, this is off the coast of Australia, these puffs coming out there, those are whales that, you know, they come to the surface and they blow. And uh, th this is a drone run by a scientist uh, that is gonna capture some of that whale breath. I'm gonna show you how this works. So the, that whale blew and the, the scientist saw it. He opened up the dish, collected the droplets. We'll play it again, oops. We'll play it again. You see all the droplets collecting. You take it back to the lab and you can say what viruses are in whale breath. And there are tons of them. It doesn't tell you what's actually in the whale. That's hard to do, right? You need to catch a whale and <laughs> forget that. You find dead whales on the beach all the time, but that not, might not be representative. But this gives you sort of an idea what might be in the respiratory uh, tract of the whale. But the point is that we can sample many, many different animals that we weren't able to do before. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in this course. I mentioned earlier that um, there are viral genomes integrated into our DNA. So here is a pie chart of the human genome, 3.2 billion bases, right? So all of you have a genome of about 3.2 billion bases of double-stranded DNA, as you probably know. And these are the components of the genome. Only one and a half percent actually codes for proteins, which is really remarkable, right? Most of the rest is non-coding, yet it's all functional. Uh, there are introns, intervening sequences, for example, they are 25%. But for our purposes, uh, up here, 8% of our genome, we have here LTR retrotransposons. These are sequences uh, related to old viral infections that happened many, many years ago, and they have remained integrated into our germline, which is why they are passed on uh, to our offspring. And I will tell you later on that some of the genes of those viruses we use now to help our biology work. And we'll give you specific examples of that later. And this is the case for most uh, organisms that we have studied. Now, of course, on top of all that, viruses are dangerous and they can kill people. So this is a graph of the causes of 2019 global deaths. And remember, this is, this is highly inaccurate because many countries have horrible reporting. They don't report any diseases at all. So these are only in countries that report them. Nevertheless, uh, you can see the, the biggest killer are, are cardiovascular diseases globally for, for 2019, uh, 19 million deaths. Uh, and then we have cancers, 10 million deaths just below that, respiratory diseases, and then all the way down. And I just wanna point out that COVID has killed about 7 million people as of December. So that would put it third uh, on this list here, of course. And these red arrows are diseases there that uh, are caused in part by viruses. So respiratory diseases, which is a number three killer, lower respiratory infections, uh, number four. So your respiratory tract, we divide into upper and lower for disease purposes. And many viruses infect the upper tract and, and remain there and cause mild diseases like colds. Uh, and then many of them move to the lower tract and cause more severe diseases like pneumonias. And so those are reflected in those two numbers. Diarrheal diseases, many of them, I would say most are caused by viruses like norovirus. There's HIV AIDS uh, in 2019, less than a million deaths, which is good because we can treat and prevent death now. And then all the way further down uh, is uh, hepatitis, much of which uh, is viral. And we're going to talk about all of these in the second half of the course. The first half of this course, by the way, we're going to talk about the mechanisms by which viruses reproduce. And then the second half, we will talk about how they cause diseases and how we can prevent them uh, and so forth. But nevertheless, even though that chart is very sobering, a lot of deaths caused by viruses, most of the viruses that infect us don't have a negative effect on our health. And it's an interesting question to find out why, right? Because if we can learn how viruses coexist with us, we may be able to develop therapies to prevent uh, other virus infections. So um, let's explore some of the reasons why 
viruses might not harm us. First of all, many viruses just pass through us. And I said earlier, you eat a lot of viruses in your food. If you like cabbage, it's full of insect viruses. And there was one study, I like cabbage, I think it's great, um, but it's full of insect viruses. A study in Washington DC, they sampled cabbage from five different supermarkets and they cut up the cabbage and look for viruses and each serving of cabbage would have up to 10 to the eighth particles of an insect virus. This is the insect virus here. It's called a baculovirus. It infects this uh, insect here called the cabbage looper, which crawls on the surface of cabbage and sheds virus. And you know they, they nominally wash cabbage before you get it just to get the dirt off, right? And when you pick it up in the supermarket, all those virus particles are on it and you will eat them but they will pass through you because it's an insect virus and viruses are quite host specific with a few exceptions. And so those viruses won't, won't harm you. But now you can still eat cabbage. Don't be afraid of it. Many people take this course and say, professor, now I don't eat anything. <laughs> but you can eat cabbage for sure. Uh, the viruses will pass through you. Another interesting one, uh, if you take bulk feces and look for RNA viruses, which you can do. There's actually a company <laughs> that will do this. You can mail them your feces and they will extract the RNA and sequence it and tell you how many viruses you have. And I get emails all the time, Professor, what do I do? I have this pepper virus in my poop. Oh, that's very interesting, pepper virus in my poop. And it's a virus that infects peppers, as you can see here. This is a pepper uh, infected with pepper mild model virus. It's the most abundant viruses in our feces because all of us like peppers and also the pepper that you grind up also has viruses. 10 to the ninth virus particles per gram of dry feces. Anyway, this also passes through you. It's not going to hurt you. So you can eat peppers and you can put pepper on your food. Yes, right. So the question is, what does this mean similar to plant viruses? So when you, when you sequence this material, you get a lot of sequences that look like viruses. There are a number of ways that you can tell that, but most of them aren't, aren't a specific virus that we have in a database, for example. They have some homology, so we can say it's probably a plant virus, but we don't know exactly what it is. And that's the case for most of these studies. So the whale sampling, I would say probably 90% of the viruses are unknown. You get sequences that look like a virus sequence, but you don't know what it is because we haven't done enough sampling up until now to know that. There are also beneficial viruses. Clearly, I think most of the viruses in us are beneficial, but it's hard to know. It's hard to do the experiments to know. But here are two examples where we know viruses are beneficial for their hosts. On the left is a plant that lives around hot springs. So if you go to Yellowstone where there's hot springs, there are plants growing around it. They are thermotolerant. They can live at high temperatures. And this one is called dicanthelium lanuginosum. You don't need to ever know these names, but they're there for your reference. Uh, you can bring it in a lab and it will grow at 55 C, which is pretty warm. And it turns out that it is infected with a fungus that has within it a virus. And if you take the fungus virus pair out, the plants will not grow at high temperatures. So somehow this fungus virus combination, and you need both, the fungus alone doesn't do it, the virus alone doesn't do it. Somehow it's conferring thermotolerance to the plant. And the fungus and the virus get a place to live and reproduce and it doesn't seem to hurt the plant. On the right is another example. Uh, these are wasp viruses. So parasitoid wasps inject their eggs into insect larvae and they reproduce in the insect larvae and then the larvae eat the caterpillar and then burst out. You know, you know that movie Alien, right? This is the original alien. <laughs> they didn't invent anything. So the egg that the wasp injects is also accompanied by viruses. These little blue particles, those are viruses. They're called polydnoviruses that are injected along with the egg. They're encoded in the wasp genome. The wasp has these viruses encoded. They are made in the oviducts. They are deposited with the egg. And then those viruses reproduce in the caterpillar and immunosuppress it so it doesn't reject the uh, larva, the wasp larva. Otherwise, the, the caterpillar would reject it immunologically and it wouldn't grow. So it's beneficial for the wasp, not so much for the caterpillar, right? 
but it's, a, it's partially beneficial in this case for the wasp. So many examples of this uh, in nature, for example, there are viruses of ants. Normally ants stay low in the tree canopy, but this virus makes them crawl to the top where the birds can pick them off and carry the viruses somewhere else. So it changes their behavior. All kinds of examples like that. Uh, so what about mammals? Are viruses beneficial to mammals? There's one good example, and that's here. It's an experiment done here at NYU by Ken Cadwell. And this is done in mice. So in, mice in the laboratory, you, you can, all right, so even though they're lab mice, they have lots of bacteria in their intestines. And here's, we call them conventional mice. They're just bred normally. They have plenty of bacteria in their intestines. And here are sections of the intestine. You can see very nice villi. And so morphologically good. And then at the bottom, these villi sections are stained to show white blood cells. So there's also an extensive immune system in the intestine. And the, um, th those brown cells represent that. Now, you can grow mice under germ-free conditions where they don't have bacteria in their gut. And so here is, that's GF. These are sections from germ-free mice. And you can see the villi are morphologically aberrant and there are no lymphocytes in the, in the villi, as you can see below, no staining with, for the brown cells. So you need the microbiome, the bacteria in the gut in order to get proper development morphologically of the villi and also proper development of the immune system. You can partially restore that by infecting the mouse with a virus, marine norovirus, MNV. So this is a common virus uh, of mice. And if you infect them, you now partially restore the villi morphology and you restore the immune system in the gut. You now have lymphocytes there. And so apparently the bacteria are essential for development of the gut and the immune system, but viruses can do that as well. We can't do these experiments in people, right? We don't have a antiviral that would remove all of your viruses. We only have specific antivirals. We have Paxlovid, which we can use to treat you if you have SARS-CoV-2 infection. We have a a AIDS drugs, HIV antivirals, but it's not gonna take away your microbiome. Uh, so we don't know if our viruses have functions like this, but someday we will have broadly acting antivirals and maybe a side effect of those will be negative in that we have problems without uh, the viruses. We might, we might see that. Another reason viruses are mostly not harmful to us is we have amazing immune systems. Some of you may have taken Dr. Schindler's immunology course and learned this. This is just a figure to show the extensive interactions among components of the immune cells. It's great at keeping us uninfected or in the case of viruses, keeping them low enough so that they don't cause disease. They continue to reproduce in us, but they don't cause disease. And if your immune system is down, for example, I mentioned earlier, if you're immunosuppressed for, by virtue of a virus infection or uh, an organ transplant, you're immunosuppressed, many of these viruses will start to reproduce and cause disease in you. So the simplest virus that is innocuous to all of us and which is present in all of us will cause a problem. For example, you get an organ transplant, you get immunosuppressed, so you don't reject the organ. Now your herpes viruses will begin to multiply and cause problems for you. So this is why we do well with many viruses. Our immune system keeps them in check. Here's an exa another example of a virus that uh, doesn't make you sick, but also can be used to find interesting information about the host. This is a polyoma virus. It's a small virus that contains uh, DNA, and these infect every human. We'll talk more about those later. They infect you early in life. You get them from your family members, and then you, you keep them forever. And if you're immunosuppressed, they can cause problems. But you can trace human migrations by seeing which polyoma viruses infect which people, because they're always transmitted among families, and families typically move together. And so this is a map showing human migrations out of Africa. The, um, the purple is the migration pattern that we know of looking at the human genome out of Africa into Europe uh, and Asia across the land bridge into North America. But if you look at the 
kinds of polyomaviruses that our humans are infected with, you get a much detailed picture. More, you can see humans moving into Australasia and all the way down into South America. So these, again, these are innocuous viruses and we're using them to trace uh, human migrations. Now, on a bigger scale, viruses can shape host populations. I mean, we've seen in the COVID pandemic, you know, seven million people have died, but that is not a major evolutionary effect, I would argue, um, because it's a small fraction of the human population. But there are many organisms that on a large scale are affected by virus infections. And this is a great example. Uh, this is a satellite view, a satellite photograph. I think it's off the coast of Greece. I don't remember. You, you may think it's Italy, but it's not. It's not the toe of Italy. Anyway, uh, it's a photo from high up, and this, these uh, bluish areas, white bluish area, are phytoplankton. These are huge blooms of plankton, single-celled eukaryotes that grow. And as they grow, they get so big that you can see them from space. And then they're all accompanied by viruses. They collapse because the viruses infect them and, and lyse them. So the viruses control these populations. And this is seen with many other infections of organisms in the oceans, including algal. Algal, like brown algae and, and red algae are all, they cause huge blooms and then they're collapsed by the viruses. And so that's probably part of the natural uh, biological control built into the system. So these are just some examples of why I think viruses are amazing and warrant the course of its own, which by the way, 15 years ago, there was no virology course here. And that's why I, I started teaching it, but it's clear that they are fascinating uh, and worth learning about. What I like to tell you at this point is that virology is an integrative science. Unlike chemistry or physics or biochemistry, where you study one thing, with virology, you need to study many sciences. So you need to study, of course, uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry. You need to know cell biology to understand viruses because viruses reproduce in cells. But you also need to understand the hosts. So you may need to study animal populations, ecology, sociology, how, what drives hosts to interact, right? If you're locked down for six months during a pandemic, what makes people suddenly go out and decide they need to go to the pub and get infected, right? That's sociology <laughs> and even psychology to see how people react to having their lives change. So that's what I mean by it's an integrated science. You can really learn a lot about all other things by studying these uh, minute particles. So in my course, I have, I have three goals. It's, it's designed to give you a big picture. I don't want you to particularly know the details. I want you to see the overall picture of how things work. And I don't, I'm not gonna teach you about uh, more than five or six specific viruses to illustrate this uh, big picture. I want you to learn about virology as an integrative discipline. In other words, the whole picture of how viruses reproduce and get into their hosts and cause disease and how that is resolved or not. Not individual viruses, as I say here, I'm not gonna, teach you about 20 different viral diseases. I'm not gonna tell you much about individual viral genes. I want you to see the big picture. And you know, the, most people don't know any of this because they don't have a virology course. Most colleges don't have virology courses. In fact, many smaller colleges use my lectures to teach here to teach their virology course. They often email me, say, can I use your lectures? And then we'll have it, I said, absolutely. So, this course goes to many, many more people, and that's, that's what I want to do. It goes to many countries. I've had many emails from China. May we uh, take your, vir your lectures? Well, of course, just take them. I don't care. I want you to just learn. I don't want any obstacle to you learning. In fact, my philosophy is that education should be free. Now, I know you're paying a lot for it here, so, <laughs> so don't get mad that I'm saying that. But... It, there are many people in the world who could do amazing things if they had an education and they can't afford it. And at least in science, I wanna remedy that to, to the extent that I can. And that's why I say you learn things that 
amaze the informed and frighten the uninformed because people who don't know are scared about viruses. At the beginning of the pandemic, people were scared because they didn't know what was going to happen. They couldn't see a clear picture because we didn't have one. And then, and of course, people made up stuff and that made it even worse. But we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go on. The other thing I'm going to try and teach you is why the press is often wrong about reporting on viruses. And, and this was exacerbated during the pandemic when most virologists don't want to talk to the press. And so they, the press finds what I call pundits who like to increase their Twitter X followers, you know, and get very well known, but they don't know any virology. So you get headlines like this. So the top one, very beginning of the pandemic, you can see 430 cases in Wuhan initially, actually Thailand, Japan, South Korea, and US. Uh, the virus could mutate and spread further. So you will know at the end of this course that that's a ridiculous headline. It's like saying the earth is round in a newspaper headline. You would never say that because viruses mutate every second. Every reproduction cycle, viruses are mutating and they don't get that. Um, and there's another one below, an opinion piece in the New York Times. The coronavirus is mutating and America's leaders are flying blind. These frustrate me greatly and we will talk more about this later. Um, but some other examples of terrible press. Um, the US is in a fifth COVID wave and immunity is waning. Why aren't second boosters available to oral Americans? You know, that's how the immune system works. Immunity goes down after a few months. You can't keep it high for every antigen we encounter. We depend on memory to respond to new infections. And in fact, for people who were immunized properly, their memory is great and they are protected from severe disease. So that, this headline doesn't get it. But again, it's in Fortune, where they maybe know about money, but not viruses, right? And now more recently, we have problems with science being politicized. Republicans spin NIH letter about gain of function research. So we will talk about gain of function research later, which is basically giving a new property to any organism. And, you know, certain people think SARS-CoV-2 was made in a laboratory or escaped from a laboratory and it's become politicized. And so uh, there have been bans on this work. Um, the House not too long ago approved this research. And recently, Wisconsin just uh, approved the ban of gain of function research. Almost every biological research that's done involves gain of function research. So this is, this is downright ignorant, but it's politically driven because they know a fraction of the American population will say, yeah, we shouldn't be doing this because it started the pandemic and it will get their votes. And that's not how science should be. And uh, I hope you will learn that in part from this course. Okay, so this is an example of a quiz that we're going to do. Which statement is true? All viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most viral infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting. Our immune system cannot handle most viral infections. Just pick one. Most of you got, got um, B, which is correct. All right, so what is a virus anyway? Here's my definition, an infectious obligate intracellular parasite. It's got DNA or RNA as genetic material. It's got a protein coat around it, and sometimes it has a membrane, all right? So at minimum, DNA or RNA and a protein coat. So some viruses are just that. Here is um, an adenovirus right here. It's a protein coat, and inside is DNA. But here's SARS-CoV-2. It is RNA, there's a protein coat around it, and then there's a membrane on top of the protein coat. But you don't need a membrane to be a virus. All you need is some kind of nucleic acid in a package. So it's very simple. Now, what does this mean, infectious obligate intracellular parasite? So infectious obviously means it can go from host to host, from one host to another, and infect or reproduce in the second host. An obligate intracellular parasite means viruses have to get into your cells and in order to reproduce. They will not reproduce outside of a cell. So intracellular, obligate intracellular, that's what that means. And a parasite is something that takes away from a different organism. So viruses take things from our cells, they take nutrients, they take energy and so forth. 
and in doing so they damage those cells. So that's what a parasite is. It takes things from a host and damages it as opposed to say a symbiosis where different organisms are living together happily. So that's our virus uh, definition. And as we study viruses, because they're obligate intracellular parasites, when we study viruses, we can learn all about the host as well. And we've learned many things about hosts from studying viruses, and we'll, st we'll, we'll touch on some of those uh, in, in this course. By the way, this um, picture of tulips there, those are very prized tulips in Holland, and they have the striping pattern on them, which is caused by a virus infection. So as they bred to get this striping pattern, they were breeding to get viruses to do that. Yes? Okay, so that's a good question. Are the beneficial viruses parasites? And um, so I think if you, if you look at it at a cellular level, probably in those hosts, this, the virus is taking things from the cell that the cell would ordinarily need, and it's probably causing damage. But we don't see damage on the level of the organism like the human, but they're still parasites. They're taking something away. I guess you'd like to know if viruses are alive, right? Um, this is a <laughs> burning question. I used to have a poll on my website, and this, these were the results. You can see it was split between yes, no, something in between. So I spent many years thinking about this. Are viruses alive? And here's the solution I came up with. A virus is an organism with two phases. So when you say virus, most people think of the virus particle, right? which is, that's a polyomavirus particle. It's a DNA virus with a protein shell. But that's only one of the two phases of the virus organism. That's the infectious particle, which is not live, it's not living. It cannot be living. If you have a tube of this, it will just sit there and never ever reproduce or do anything because it needs a living host. So I don't know how that could be living. However, when the virus infects a cell, it completely reprograms the cell to make more viruses. And so the infected cell is certainly living, right? It's a cell, it's alive until it's broken apart and, and killed by the virus infection. So if you look at it this way, a virus is living, but you have to remember that the virus means an organism with two phases. And most people, when they say virus, they're talking about the infectious particle. So if you just modify the way you think about it, I think we come to a, a good conclusion. And I, I think, in fact, when most people say viruses are alive, they're thinking of the infected cell, right? A virus can reproduce in an infected cell, it can undergo mutation, it can undergo evolution. These are all things associated with uh, living organisms. All right, so a virus is a organism with two phases, yeah. Ah, that's a good question. So the question is, if you have infectious particles in a tube and sitting on the bench, yeah, eventually it will lose infectivity. It depends how long. Some viruses can last a few days. Others can last months. But if you freeze it, it will last forever. It's infectivity, right? So most of them will break apart uh, with time. And, you know, early in the pandemic, people were saying, well, how long does SARS-CoV-2 last on a surface, on a subway pole, and so forth? And that's why, because we were worried about how long it would take to, to lose infectivity. Now, another thing I wanna warn you about is don't think that viruses are human. I know you don't think that, but sometimes you give them human qualities and that's what anthropomorphizing viruses means. You say, the virus wants to do this. It wants to infect this host in order to do this. And that's really bad because first of all, Viruses have no wants or desires or thoughts. They are completely just packages of chemicals. And when they infect the cell, everything just happens in a program and they have no say in the matter, all right? They're completely passive agents. And so if you say, if you assign human goals to viruses, you are assuming that they are achieving what they do in a human-centric manner and that's we don't know if that's the case. You say, oh, the, the virus wants to kill the host in order to do this. How would you know? You have no idea. So please do not make viruses human because 
it's bad because it clouds your thinking about evolution. For example, evolution of viruses is a passive process. Let's say there's a virus in a bat somewhere, and suddenly that collection of viruses finds itself in a human, which can happen all the time. And one of those viruses has a mutation in it which allows it to reproduce in humans, and now it reproduces well, and that can infect other humans and cause a pandemic, maybe. And you may say, well, the virus wanted to infect the human in order to reap. No, it, it just got there accidentally. It had no desire, it had no, no locomotion, it has no anything. It's just a passive event that depends on chance. Okay, so think of it that way. Otherwise, you're gonna be clouded by human, human emotions driving uh, viruses. And another part of the virus definition I used to have in my lectures was that viruses are very small. Um, Here's an E. coli at 100,000 magnification. And there is a bacteriophage on its surface, give you a, a sort of an indication of the size. Here is tobacco mosaic virus, which we'll talk about. It's a plant virus, the first virus discovered. Here's HIV in D. And then there's a panel here, which is expanded further. So it's now a million fold. And there we have some cellular molecules. Uh, we, have a we have a ribosome there. We have an antibody in F, we have a tRNA in C, and A is an atom. And this is a virus H, that's poliovirus. You can see it's about the size of a ribosome, so very small compared to cells. If you're wondering how many viruses fit on the head of a pin, this used to be a question people always asked. I don't know why, but I put it here so that you know. There's a pin head, and by the way, this we won't use millimeters very much because it's too big. And viruses are, are very small, but a millimeter, two millimeters would be about 2,000 microns. Anyway, if you could do the calculation, about 500 million rhinoviruses, which cause common colds, they're about the size of the ribosome, could fit on the head of a pin. And in fact, when you sneeze and you're infected with a rhinovirus, you spew out many, many uh, tens of thousands of, of particles. Um, here on this pin head, by the way, here's a dust mite, and that's a hair laying on top of it. It's a dust mite. And then this box is expanded to the right here, and we have, we have a yeast cell, we have a lymphocyte, we have red blood cells, and then here's some bacteria in green and in yellow. And then that tiny thing there that's an Ebola virus, which happens to be a pretty long virus that you can see easily. And so that's the scale compared to other things. We used to think viruses are small, but a number of years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, what we now call giant viruses were discovered. And, this, and they made the cover of American Scientist. Here's a giant virus called Mimi virus. Here is rhinovirus and HIV. So much bigger than any virus we had ever seen before, and since then, many more have been discovered and have really added a lot to uh, what we understand about viruses. But uh, on the right here is a cell uh, infected with Mimi viruses. They're very unusual. They have a fuzzy surface. It looks like hair almost. And we think this is so that their host, which we think are amoeba, which are very phagocytic, can easily grab them and take them up. And we've discovered many, I say we, not me at all, right? I, we, we virologists have discovered many giant viruses and they're, lo they're listed here in this figure, virion size in nanometers going from zero to about 1600. So here's the biggest uh, virus that we've ever seen. Pandora virus is also quite large. In fact, Pandora virus you can see here, this is a light micrograph. Most viruses you need an electron micrograph to see. This thing is about a, 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 a 1.5 microns in length, and you can see it under a light microscope, so it's really huge. And you can see that the pithoviruses are, are even bigger. These have very interesting and creative names uh, that we will touch on a bit later. Another key fact about viruses is that they don't divide like bacteria. They don't split into two, right? A bacteria, if you put in broth, will pretty shortly afterwards start to divide and one will become two and then four and eight and 16. Binary fission. Viruses don't do that. Viruses get into a cell, they make parts 
to make new viruses. They're assembled, and then those new viruses leave the cell. So it's not binary fission. It's very different. We say replicate by assembly of preformed components. So when you infect a cell with a virus, the virus will get in, put its nucleic acid in the cell, and you won't see any new virus particles made for some time. This is a graph of time versus number of infectious particles. There's always this lag period, which we call eclipse, and that's the period when the particles are being made, the parts are being made, and then they're assembled and suddenly you get infectious viruses. And then again, that's very different from uh, what happens in bacteria. All right, so this is another question that you've already answered. Question is, which of the following is true concerning bacterial versus viral replication? Viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria do not replicate via binary fission. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. Viruses do not have an eclipse. Viruses replicate by binary fission. So question two, uh, most of you got A. Viruses must assemble using preformed components. That's right. How old are they? How old are viruses? Well, uh, we have very interesting techniques that we can use now. To, we look at viral genome sequences, the DNA or the RNA, and we can do dating. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the course. But um, some of the oldest viruses have been estimated to be about 450 million years old. Uh, 450 million years ago is the Ordovician period, which would be right here in, in the development of Earth. The first land plants are happening there. It's before the dinosaurs and the mammals and so forth. So uh, a long time ago, and they probably originated in the oceans. And there's some suggestions that this kind of cephalopod was in fact uh, infected with, with viruses. Um, but as I'll tell you, when we talk about evolution, we think viral ancestors actually existed before cells in the precellular world. There were probably viral genomes that were able to replicate on their own, which didn't require a cell. So whether they're viruses or not is questionable, but they're certainly the precursors of viruses, and we will talk about that uh, later. We begin to see ancient references to viral diseases in the in historical records. On the left there is a, a, a Greek flask where is inscribed on it. Um, here this fire, this is from the Iliad. Here this firebrand, rabid Hector leads the charge. So presumably referring to rabies, the viral disease, 700 BCE. And then the Egyptian carving on the right, showing a priest with a leg that is withered and has a drop foot, which means the leg is paralyzed. So if, you're, if, you, you know, if, you, if your leg is normal, you, you can lift up the foot, but if it's paralyzed, the foot drops, and that's exactly what he has. So it could be that that was polio. You can see records of people trying to prevent viral diseases over the years. There's records in China, 11th century, of variolation, where people, at the time, smallpox was a big deal. People found that anyone who recovered from smallpox never got it again. They didn't know it was a virus. They didn't even know it was an infection, but they said, well, if we give this to people, maybe it will protect them. And they developed a process called variolation. We would take the pustules of smallpox, you get a rash from smallpox, take them, grind them up, and inoculate people either by blowing them into the nose, as you see there, or injecting them, and they were protected. Unfortunately, about 10% of them died. So not a good vaccine, right? And again, these people had no knowledge of the agent, but this practice was brought to uh, England in the 1790s, and Edward Jenner eventually used it to establish vaccination, which we'll talk about later. Now, the whole idea that there are microorganisms, that there are things smaller than us, and things that are smaller than everything that you can look at with your eye, arose uh, in the 1600s by Leeuwenhoek, who developed a microscope and saw that there were submicroscopic uh, organisms. Pasteur said the bacteria can grow and do interesting things like make cheese and wine and fermentations. And then Edward Koch in Germany said these bacteria can cause disease. So by the end of the 1800s, we knew that bacteria, microorganisms could cause disease. Now where did viruses come in? Is, early as 1728, the name virus was used to describe any agent that caused an infectious disease, which means it goes from one person to the next. And virus 
is Latin for poison. So these viruses were thought to be liquids. And in fact, Pasteur at one point said, every virus is a microbe. So in other words, every virus which causes an infectious disease is a microbe. He didn't know anything about viruses, he just knew bacteria. The key event was the development of this filter in, in Paris to clean up the water, because Parisian water in, in the late 1800s was full of bacteria. So this guy Chamberlain, working in Pasteur's lab, he developed this porcelain filter, which you could pass water through and it would retain bacteria. Now Pasteur was studying the rabies agent and he found that the rabies agent went through the filter. So he said, ah, it's a small bacteria. Then it was a disease of tobacco that arose in the 1800s. Tobacco, mosaic disease, it modeled the surface of the leaves. Already at this time, smoking was a big deal. So people wanted to know what was causing this. And it turned out that you could not grow the agent in a broth, but it would pass through a filter and it would infect other uh, tobacco plants. And so two independent people in 92 and 98 found that the agent passes through the filter. And so either it's very small or it's something unique. And then in 1898, an animal virus was discovered in the same way, the foot and mouth disease virus, which causes lesions in the mouth of cows, goes through the filter. So it's small, but the key concept is it doesn't replicate in a broth. It needs a host in order to be replicating. But they still thought it was a liquid. So they were called filterable viruses as a consequence. And we discovered a number of them over the years. The first human virus was yellow fever, then rabies, smallpox, polio virus, et cetera. Uh, and it wasn't until um, the electron microscope was de developed that we could see that viruses are actually particulate. So in 1939, the first electron microscope graph of a bacteriophage was made, and you could see their particles, they're not liquids. And so that was a key, a key point. And this experiment, in addition, which we've looked at, showed that viruses were not simply small bacteria, because we know that bacteria divide by fission, viruses do not. And so that, together with the particular nature, particulate nature showed that viruses were not simply small uh, bacteria. All right, we're gonna skip this last one because we're running out of time. We now know, we have lots of pictures of viruses and we know they are particulate. There's a bacteriophage, there's tobacco mosaic virus, a rabies virus, a polio virus. It's quite clear that they're particular in nature. And we have beautiful structures of viruses that we will talk about when we describe how they are built. And uh, we now classify them in a variety of ways, but mostly by the nature and sequence of the nucleic acid in the virus particle. So nowadays, if you say you have a person with an unusual disease, you sequence, say, their respiratory fluid, you find a viral sequence, you can immediately classify it by comparing it to a database uh, of organisms. So we don't need to know anything about the, the shell or the lipid or the dimensions or what causes, what kind of disease it causes. It's only based on nucleic acid. And so we, organize viruses into families and genera and species. And I'll be probably referring to this quite a bit. Families will end in viridae. The genus is simply Ebola virus, and then the species is a particular kind uh, of the virus. And nowadays, we like to know how many viruses are out there. And this is a study done a couple of years ago in China where they extracted RNA from 220 invertebrate species, like insects and crustaceans and nematodes and mollusks. And they sequenced the nucleic acid. They found 1,400 new viruses. And so this is what I mean by sampling. We are barely sampling everything out there. And so there are many more viruses to be discovered. So why do we care about any of this? Why do we care about finding new viruses? Well, first of all, viruses outnumber cellular life. They're the greatest biodiversity on Earth. They drive global cycles, as I told you, Earlier, they shape host populations. They're probably beneficial, and of course, they're sources of new pathogens. This is why we uh, care about viruses. And so the, the, the goal of this course is to put all this complexity in order. There are two facts that I'm gonna give you now, and then we'll carry on later. First, the genome is a parasite that can only function in a cell. 
And once that genome gets in, it has to make messenger RNA that can be translated by host ribosomes. So they are also parasites of the host translation machinery. And next time, we will start to explore how viruses reproduce in cells, and that's called uh, the infectious cycle.